Welcome to Blazing Fast Content with Firebase and AMP. I'm Michael Bly. I'm an engineer on the Firebase hosting and Firebase CLI. Now, I want to start with a question. What makes a website fast? Because that's the goal, right? No matter what kind of experience I'm building, I want it to be fast. But to answer this question, I first need to ask another. What do we mean by fast? Do I mean low latency, very responsive, low time to first paint, time to interactive? Really, I mean any of these, and all of them some of the time. The most important thing to remember is that fast websites feel fast to the user. That's our end goal, right? That's the only thing that really matters. When a real user visits our site, it should feel fast and responsive to them. So going back to that original question, what makes a website fast? The answer, like with most things, is, well, it kind of depends. There are so many factors that go into real and perceived performance. And you can spend hours or days focusing on any one of them. So I'd like to simplify a bit and look at performance in terms of two different kinds of web experiences. First, let's imagine an email client. This is an application with a single entry point for users. They will almost always load it up by the same URL. Also, it requires authentication before any kind of action can be performed. The signed out experience for our email client is just a login page. An email client is going to be open all day and updated continuously as new messages arrive. So the presented data changes constantly. Finally, email clients are highly interactive. Your most important actions are being able to click into messages and read them, being able to reply to them, being able to compose new messages. So you're sort of constantly navigating around the interface and performing new actions. Now, let's contrast that to a content site. So that could be a news site, a resource, a blog, anything where the primary reason for someone to visit is to read the content that's available there. Unlike the email client, the primary entry point for a content site is likely to be a deep link to a particular article that was posted by social media or discovered through search. Content sites are publicly accessible. It doesn't require a login to view. While new articles may be created on a regular basis, once created, they're generally going to stay stable with a few updates here and there. And again, reading and scrolling are our primary interactions here. We aren't as concerned with being able to do other actions than just look at the page, see what's on the page, scroll down to see more of what's on the page. So what do we do to make an email client fast? Well, here we're going to follow the best practices for progressive web apps. We can build with the app shell pattern, where a service worker caches all of the JavaScript, HTML, CSS, et cetera, that's needed to render our site. And then we can use API calls to fetch data and render it client side. Now, this is actually a fascinating topic, and I could go into detail. But it's also not what we're here to cover today. I want to talk about how to make content sites fast. And it's actually pretty different from what you're going to do in the sort of rich client experience. Fundamentally, for content sites, we have to optimize for first page load. This means that our ideal and common case is when someone is visiting the website for the very first time. They don't have anything in their cache for our site. They don't have anything at all about our site on their computer. And that changes how we need to optimize performance. This means we need as few round trips as possible before the page gets painted. Especially in poor connectivity environments, every round trip the browser has to make before it displays content is just going to kill performance. We also need to minimize scripts and styles that block page render. Any critical CSS that you have should be inlined right away. Finally, we need extremely low latency from the server. We need to be delivering content close to the user so that the time that it takes for them to request a page and then actually have the page sent back to them is as small as possible. So what does a performant website look like? Well, 
it might look like this. This is actually incredibly performant HTML. There's no style sheet. There's no blocking scripts. This is just a few bytes of text that we send over the wire, and we're good to go. And you know, I'd say, if this were the 90s, I'd say, let's go for it. But it's 2018, and user expectations go a little bit further than default browser style sheets. That's where AMP comes in. AMP stands for Accelerated Mobile Pages and is an open source library created by Google specifically to provide a foundation for fast content sites. AMP is fast by default because AMP stops you from doing things that slow down your web experience. With AMP, you can't do any custom JavaScript at all. CSS has to be inlined. You're not allowed to load any style sheets externally. Instead, AMP adds functionality and interactive behavior through specially approved custom elements that are part of the AMP project. This also means that AMP pages can be efficiently cached by search engines or social networks and preloaded in advance of user interaction. So when you do a Google search and you see those little lightning bolt icons and then you tap on that and it loads instantly, that's because Google has cached the app AMP content. And as soon as you made the search query, it started loading that AMP content in the background so that it was already ready to go by the time you tapped the link in search. So this content has been preloaded and served by the AMP cache. Now, it is important to remember, because it can sound a little scary up front, like, oh, this AMP is just like, it's a whole different system that's being built on top of HTML. This is radically different. But for the most part, when you're building an AMP page, you're just writing standard HTML. So let's take a look at sort of the boilerplate AMP page. And you can see that this looks pretty much like any other HTML page. The only difference is we have that cool little lightning bolt in the HTML tag. And uh, where the dot, dot, dot in the AMP boilerplate style tag is, there would be just a number of styles that have to be included by AMP by default so that it can sort of do the right things in terms of displaying content by loading the, the AMP runtime. And while AMP is mostly just HTML, that doesn't mean that it's only HTML uh, and only sort of the standard tags you get with the browser. AMP is HTML with some custom elements that are designed to bring you modern niceties without sacrificing performance. So let's take a look at just a couple of those. First, we have AMP image. Now, the AMP image tag is actually baked into the AMP runtime. So you don't have to load anything extra or special to get this. This just comes with. Um, and the first thing that it does is this controls the loading of the image to ensure maximum efficiency. So when you load an AMP page, it's not necessarily going to load every image on the page immediately the way it would if you were using a standard image tag. Instead, it will sort of do its own optimizations to figure out when's the right time to render something. It might wait until you scroll it into view. It might wait for other things. The AMP runtime handles that for you, so you don't have to think about it. Next, you'll notice this little layout responsive attribute that's on the AMP image. Layout responsive tells, the, tells AMP that this element should fill the horizontal width of its container and then match the height based on what you supply in width and height. So normally, while you might have to specify exact image dimensions, with AMP, if you're using the responsive layout, you can just specify an aspect ratio. So here, I just say it's 1.33 to 1. Another thing that AMP gives you with AMP image is the ability to do placeholders for any element. So here, inside my first AMP image, I have another AMP image with a placeholder attribute. And the source for that is just a data URI with a super low resolution version of the image that I want to load. So essentially, on the server, I inline this super low, image data, super low resolution data URI. And then that gets loaded almost immediately because it's small and tiny. And the AMP runtime says, OK, let's do this. And then when my higher resolution image is loaded, it'll just instantly swap it, snap in and replace the placeholder. So this is a great way to give sort of improved perceived performance, where you can get an idea of what the page content is going to look like before it's 100% loaded. Some elements aren't baked into the AMP runtime, and you have to load them separately via a script tag. So 
here's a script tag to load the AMP font uh, element. And you can see that this is really straightforward. It just has a custom element attribute that describes what the element is going to be named. And then it points to the AMP CDN to load the script. You'll also notice that it's an async tag. And this is true of all AMP custom elements. Because like I said, we're trying to minimize blocking scripts and styles. So all AMP custom elements are loaded asynchronously. The only blocking script in an AMP page is the AMP runtime itself. Now, AMP font is actually pretty cool. What it lets you do is essentially control the font loading behavior of the browser and optimize it for performance. So essentially, you can add a timeout attribute to AMP font. And that says, if this much time has elapsed since the page started loading and I still don't have this font loaded, then I should abandon loading it and do something else. And you can set that to 0 to essentially say, if this font isn't already loaded and on the user's system, then I'm just going to not try to load it and do something else instead. And that something else is that when the deadline expires, AMP will add a custom CSS class to your document that you can then use to apply additional styles or switch things around, change font sizes, whatever you need to do to fall back to system default fonts. Now, I don't really have time to get into it in this session, but web fonts are very expensive from a performance perspective. If you don't need them, don't use them. Or at least use tools like AMP font to fall back quickly if they're not loading. Um, especially if you're trying to load an external style sheet, like through Google Fonts, that introduces a blocking script style request that you have to wait for before your page loads. You can inline font family to improve the performance a little bit here. But just in general, be careful and very deliberate when you're using custom fonts in a high performance content site. Now, of course, there are a lot more AMP elements than these. And I'd encourage you to explore the AMP documentation for elements that help with everything from layout to media to interactivity in your AMP pages. And another thing I want to call out is that AMP is just one way to make content sites fast. It's not the only way. If you can't use AMP or you don't want to use AMP, you don't like AMP, you don't use it. And the same techniques that I'm going to show throughout the rest of this talk will still largely apply to you and can still help to make your content site high performance. Remember, this is what we're starting with. And this is high performance. So as long as you are being careful in the way that you apply scripts and styles and all of the nice things that the web, pla web platform has gotten in the last several decades, then you can make a performant experience. So let's go back to our original checklist for making a content site fast. And we can see that AMP actually helps quite a bit. It helps us optimize for that first page load by minimizing network round trips, reducing blocking scripts and styles. And that kind of just leaves this last one, minimizing network latency. So how can we tackle that? That's where Firebase comes in. Firebase is a comprehensive platform for building mobile experiences. And today, we'll be using it to build our AMP site. Now, you may be already familiar with Firebase as a great fit for sort of these rich, highly interactive applications like our email client example from earlier. Firebase's JavaScript SDKs for products like the Real-Time Database and Cloud Firestore are great tools for highly interactive apps. But Firebase can be just as powerful for building latency-sensitive content sites. So today, we're going to try to use Firebase and AMP together and hopefully build a lightning-fast experience for our users. Now, I really love escape rooms. Working together with my friends to solve puzzles before the clock runs out, it's a lot of fun. So I built Escapable, which is a simple resource to discover escape rooms in your area. Uh, can we switch over to the demo, please? So this is Escapable. As you can see, it's very simple. I'm just going to pick San Francisco Bay here. And now you can see I just have a list of escape rooms. So the top one is Escape Google I.O. And I can scroll down and see all the other ones that are around. For each location, I can link to the website or get directions. And then I also have the, the rooms that are offered by each location. And I can tap those to expand it out and see a little bit more info. So I can see that this one is one to four players. It lasts 60 minutes, and it's 96% recommended. So that's really all that there is to this site. And it's very simple, but it also, you know, this has the kind of like rich modern look that you're looking for in a web experience. And it accomplishes what the users set out to do, which is discover escape rooms in their area. 
So remember, whenever you're tackling creating an experience of any kind, think about first what your users need to do and how you can make that experience the most efficient before you dive into other things. Can we go back to the slides? So when I set out to build Escapable, I came up with three potential approaches to make it fast. Static compilation, dynamic rendering, and evented rendering. Static compilation is probably familiar to many of you. It was also the first major use case of Firebase hosting, Firebase's developer-focused web hosting platform. Firebase hosting serves static content from a global content delivery network, automatically provisions SSL certs for free for custom domains, has atomic release management for easy deploy and rollback, and also lets you configure niceties like doing rewrites for single page apps. And for static sites, compilation happens up front on the developer's machine. So the developer is going to compile the, the assets into just HTML, CSS, whatever else they need. And those are going to be deployed to Firebase Hosting directly. Firebase Hosting will then just serve those requests from its global CDN whenever they're requested. So this is really straightforward. The advantages of static sites are clear. There is zero request time processing. You're just serving flat files. So it can be incredibly fast that way. Also, it's extremely cache efficient. Since things only change when you do a new deploy, Firebase hosting is able to efficiently cache all of the content on edge servers around the world until you do a new deploy. On the other side, it's not really suited well for frequent updates, especially for user-generated content. Remember, these assets have to be redeployed every time they change. So if you have a website where users are constantly changing things or making uh, the content shift in any way, static's not necessarily going to be a good fit. It also usually requires some dev skills to edit a static website, because usually, like I said, you're editing markdown files on your machine and then building them with Jekyll and deploying them or something like that, as opposed to using a friendly CMS-like UI. Now, there are lots of tools that are available. And again, this is not what we're going to talk about today. Because if you can use a static site, there are lots of resources to help you get started. And I encourage you to do so. There is literally not going to be a more performant way than doing a static site where you're just serving flat files. So like, you can just go do that. But uh, and in fact, the AMP project website is a static site hosted on Firebase hosting. So this is not just something that we talk about as like, oh, maybe some people should do it. This is something that we do as well. But some sites are too complex or get updated too frequently for static compilation to be a good fit. So here we turn to dynamic rendering, also commonly called server-side rendering. Now, to do dynamic rendering, we're going to have to bring in some additional features. We started with Firebase hosting. But now we're going to need to bring in Cloud Firestore to store the data for our site. Cloud Firestore is a flexible NoSQL database that can scale from weekend projects to planet scale applications. We're also going to use Cloud Functions for Firebase to do the actual server-side rendering with Node.js. Cloud Functions provides serverless compute for your Firebase project, and we can connect them directly to Firebase hosting. So let's see how that works. In a dynamic rendering world, the user requests a site from Firebase Hosting. Firebase Hosting then proxies that request to a cloud function. The cloud function is then going to go out and fetch all the data that it needs to render the page from Cloud Firestore. Once it's done that, it's going to render HTML and send that back to Hosting, which then gets sent back to the user. And if we set a cache control header on that response, then Firebase Hosting will cache that at the edge and send that back immediately instead of going back to functions every t as long as the cache hasn't expired. So the great thing about dynamic rendering is that fresh content is available immediately. Since we are rendering every time a request comes in, we know that we're getting the freshest content on every request, period. It's also a familiar architecture for most developers. Almost everyone has built some kind of request response web server in their time. And so this is something that just is easy to slot in and easy to understand. On the other hand, it's somewhat inefficient and compute expensive when you really think about it. Because like I said, we are fetching all these documents and rendering them every single time a request comes in. 
when the documents aren't actually necessarily changing all that often. It's also really difficult to efficiently cache dynamic content because since we're rendering every time and we don't necessarily know when the content has changed, we have to make a trade-off between how long can we bear to, hold, to serve up stale content versus when do we want to incur the penalty of having to re-render and compute. So how do we actually do server-side rendering with Firebase? Here's a streamlined example. Uh, as a quick note, I built Escapable using TypeScript to take advantage of modern JavaScript features like async await. And here you can see that I have just a pretty standard Express app. I'm fetching some data, I'm setting some headers, and then I'm rendering a page. Um, one thing to call out is notice that I do an await promise.all here. And that's so that I'm fetching all of the data for my page in parallel instead of fetching it one at a time and waiting for that to complete before kicking off the next fetch. It's also really important to think about cache control headers just generally in web applications, but especially for server-side rendered things on Firebase hosting. You can see here I have a max age equals 300, which is saying it's OK to cache this in your local browser for up to five minutes or 300 seconds. I also have an S dash max age set to 1,200, which says it's OK to cache this in the CDN for 20 minutes. Now again, this is something that's going to be a trade-off. If your content changes sort of at most once a day, maybe you can afford a longer TTL. But then again, maybe you can't, because maybe it only changes once a day. But when it changes, it's super vital that people see it right away. So that's something that you'll have to determine for your own app. And in this case, because I have 20 minutes on the server and five minutes on the client, I have sort of a worst case scenario of a 25 minute stale page that gets served to a user. So after that, I'm simply rendering the content using the data that I fetched and sending it back as a response, which we'll talk more about as in a moment. Now that I have my Express app, I need to register it as a cloud function and connect it to Firebase hosting. So here you can see I import the, Firebase, the Firebase functions SDK, and then I export a function using functions.https.onRequest. And then I just pass in my Express app. So when you're registering an HTTPS function, one of the things that you can do is just pass in an Express app as a handler, and that'll just work. So you don't need a special wrapper or anything like that. You can just pass the Express app right in. And now this tells. Uh, this says that when I deploy, I want an HTTPS function called app and that it's going to serve content from my Express app. Then in Firebase.json, the first thing I do is declare a public directory. And this is where my static assets will live. And in general, just like with static sites before, anything you can serve as a static file, you should. So this is where I'm putting things like the logo for Escapable and my manifest.json, things that don't change very frequently, and I'm fine redeploying the site if that's, if that's necessary when they do change. Then I'm rewriting all URLs to a function called app. And this will only rewrite URLs that aren't an exact match for something in my public directory. So I can safely just say, hey, if it doesn't exactly match a static file, then I want to send it off to my cloud function to see if it needs uh, to be rendered there. Now, I'm not going to go super in-depth into the rendering here. While you can use your favorite templating library or even something like Preact to render AMP pages, I decided to avoid libraries altogether and just use template literals with string interpolation because it's possible, so why not? Um, if you have user-generated content, though, please be sure to properly sanitize your data and don't just do this uh, because you'll have bad script injection attacks and have a bad time generally. Uh, but ultimately, this is just a function that returns a string because all I'm doing is creating my AMP page as HTML as a string. Uh, the only other thing that I did is I put CSS in separate files, and then I just inlined those in the AMP custom tag uh, by loading them literally out of my functions directory. So again, this is like very duct tape, but it works. So how well does this perform? Well, when hitting the origin and performing a full fetch of all the documents to render the page, I got a response in about a second. Sometimes it was a little better, sometimes it was a little worse, but that was kind of on average. And that's not horrible, but it's not great. But if you compare that to when the CDN was serving content, we had 21 milliseconds as the total round trip time, including delivery. That's a pretty marked difference. And if you look at the film strip, you can see that difference clear as day. 
So here we have essentially a one second difference that is the difference between the CDN and the origin. So this is 3G perf on the origin. I got my page to paint in about three seconds. On the CDN, it's in about two. Now, interestingly, if we look at the version of the page in Google's AMP cache, we knock another 800 milliseconds off of the meaningful paint time. That seems unfair, right? Like, how does how's the AMP cache get to be faster than my site? Well, it's cheating, kind of. The AMP cache does some optimizations of AMP pages when it loads them into the cache that make it perform better by doing some specific things uh, that optimize and further reduce those blocking, those render blocking scripts and styles. But what about users who come to my site directly? I want that kind of performance on my site. Well, there's a pretty new open source library called, called the AMP Toolbox. And the AMP team open sourced some tools that let us mimic the same optimizations that the AMP cache does on our own server. It does this by removing the boilerplate, locking AMP to a specific version, and inlining critical CSS. Also, once it does this, the page becomes not valid AMP, which is kind of interesting. So by optimizing the AMP, you make it invalid AMP. So the way that you approach this is you serve both the unoptimized AMP page, which can be slurped up by the AMP cache and used there, and then you also serve the optimized AMP page as the canonical link that people are going to go to when they visit your site. And we do this by installing two packages in our project, AMP Toolbox Optimizer and AMP Toolbox Runtime Version. Runtime version literally just goes out and figures out what the latest runtime version of AMP is and then tells it to you. And it does a little bit of in-memory caching, so it's not making that every time you call it. The, the optimizer contains a transform HTML function, which essentially takes valid AMP HTML, a couple arguments, and then transforms it into the optimized HTML. So how can we use this optimized function in our app? Well, we have our express endpoint, and we can essentially just copy paste that into another endpoint that's going to be our canonical page instead of our AMP page. And so here you'll notice the differences. We dropped AMP from the URL because now this is our canonical page, so it's just going to be slash region name. We also have a wait optimize in the render page because we're just wrapping our previous render block with an optimized call and we're passing in the AMP URL. Now, it's important to pass in the AMP URL because when you render an AMP page, you need to have a link rel canonical that points to the canonical version of the page on your site. And by passing this into the optimizer, we tell it to invert that because we're turning this into the canonical version of our page. So it needs to turn that link back into a link out to the AMP page. Now, when we do this dynamic, when we apply the optimizer and we compare that to our previous CDN result, that's a pretty marked improvement. We get, an, we get a full second improvement over the CDN time. And now we're painting in one second, which is really fast on 3G. What's interesting, though, is now if we go back and compare this to the AMP cache, we're actually beating that as well. So by using the AMP optimizer, you can actually beat the AMP cache in rendering your page on your domain. Now, of course, I hope that I've drilled it into you at this point that CDNs are really important for performance. All of the, these performance benefits from the optimizer that I just showed, we only get those when we're rendering from the CDN. So if we want to truly maximize performance, we need to render from the CDN as often as possible. That's where evented rendering comes in. For our dynamic rendered page, we added Firestore and Cloud Functions to Firebase Hosting to generate our HTML on the fly. Now we're going to add one more Firebase product, Cloud Storage. And what we're going to do is we're going to pre-render content on demand when the data changes and store it in Cloud Storage as a flat file to deliver later. Here's how it works. When data changes in my Firestore database, that triggers a Cloud function because you can do that with cloud functions. It's really great. Cloud, the cloud function then does two things. First, it renders the HTML and writes that to a cloud storage file. And second, it sends a request to purge the hosting cache for that specific URL. And what this enables us to do is have the content change when the content changes, not every time it's requested. 
So that all happens when the data changes. But what about when the user requests a site? So the user makes a request. And again, we're going to proxy to a cloud function. But this time, instead of calling out to Firestore and grabbing all the documents, instead we're just going to do a transparent read-through proxy straight to cloud storage. So we're going to say, I already have this stored as a flat file, so I'm just going to serve that up. And in fact, this is mimicking a lot of what the Firebase hosting origin does itself when you deploy a static site to Firebase hosting. The result is that all subsequent requests are going to be served up by the CDN. And, we can, and because we are invalidating the cache on the CDN whenever the content changes, we can set this to be an es essentially an indefinite server cache, which means that we're going to have that CDN performance more often. So the benefits here are pretty clear. You still have fresh content available instantly, just like you do with dynamic rendering. Unlike dynamic rendering, though, we only pay the cost of render when the data changes, not when the user requests the site. So if my data changes once a day, then I'm only paying that cost once a day instead of every time a user comes to my site, or every time the cache expires when a user comes to my site. You can also cache until the content changes. And because of the performance benefits of CDNs, this is kind of the critical piece. This is what lets you have static-like performance even though you're rendering content on demand in an invented way. And the only real downside here is that this may be kind of unfamiliar territory. If you're not super familiar with cloud functions and sort of piping things through events, this may be a little weird or scary to you. But we're going to walk through some code, and hopefully it'll get less so. so here is where I set up the three functions that I use to listen to when I need to re-render the page. And it's three because, remember, I'm going to need to re-render the page whenever any data changes on the page that I care about. And so for escapable, that's three different things. If the region document changes, I need to re-render the page. If a location that's in the region changes, I need to re-render the page. And if a room that's in the region changes, I need to re-render the page. So for the region, it's really simple. Just whenever it changes, period, I fire off a render. For the location and the room changes, I pull the, the region out of the document and say, OK, this is the region that I'm going to need to re-render. Also pretty simple. Now, the actual update region page is just rendering strings, basically. So we call the same render function that we used to render the HTML before. But now we call it with the data that we're fetching because the, uh, we're, we're just triggering it at a different time. So we're essentially doing the same thing, but triggering it when the data changed. We're then also generating the optimized HTML. And then we're storing both of those in cloud storage with this write and purge function. And the write and purge function, first, we just use the Firebase admin SDKs for cloud storage to save the file, to, uh, save the file into cloud storage. And then I'm going to tell you a little trick. So by making a request to Firebase hosting with the purge method, you actually tell the CDN to purge the contents, and then the next request will go through to the origin. Um, so basically, you can send this request, and then that'll cause the next request to be fresh content. Now, fair warning, this isn't exactly an official API, and it might change in the future. We're taking a look at to how we can incorporate this more officially into the Firebase hosting product, but it really enables some powerful use cases, so I wanted to give you kind of a sneak peek. Now that we've stored our content and purged the cache, we need to actually serve it up. So back to our Express app, we just write a simple bucket proxy. And all that does is, again, using the storage admin SDK, we create a read stream. We set the cache control, and this time you'll notice that the server max age is a large number. That's actually a year in seconds. So we're saying, cache this on the server for a year. And the reason that we don't care is because we're going to proactively invalidate that cache when the content changes. Then finally, we just pipe the content from our read stream down as the response. And that's all we have to do. So that was a lot of steps. And I'd like to show you how it works in, premise, in, in practice. So can we jump back to the demo, please? All right, so here we go. I've got my site. And I'm going to jump over here into my Firestore database. And I have a new room that I've been working on. The only thing that's left to add is the region. So region SFO, add that there. Now I'm going to jump over to my functions logs. And within a couple of seconds, 
we should see that the change to my Firestore database has caused the function uh, on room change to trigger. Any second now? There we go. And so you can see on room change started executing. And it did some stuff. So what we've done is we've rendered an AMP optimized version. We wrote AMP slash SFO.HTML, SFO.HTML, and then we purged both of those URLs. And it's done. Now if we jump over to cloud storage, you can see that I have the structure of my site in HTML in cloud storage. I'm going to refresh this really quickly. And once it loads back up, I'm going to click on SFO. And you can see that this was modified just now. So it's updated here. But of course, that's not actually super impressive if the website itself doesn't update. So let's try it there. So I'll hit refresh. And there we go. Now we have a new room, Flames of the Firebase, that just appeared on our site. And if I switch over and look at the dev tools here, you can see that that response served up in 841 milliseconds, which isn't super fast. I mean, it's fine. But you can also see that that was a cache miss, because this was my first request after having purged. If I go back and reload again, jump back here, now we have a response time of 10 milliseconds. And it's going to stay that way on this Edge server until my content changes. Can we go back to the slides? Now, even when just comparing the origin performance and not whether or not it's being served up by the CDN, I found that the evented rendering has about a 32% speed up over dynamic rendering, mostly because you're just proxying through to a flat file in GCS. And that's notable, but again, it's not the most important thing. The important thing is that we get this optimized CDN level of performance almost all of the time. And it's only just after our content changes and the first request to each edge server after that that we ever get anything other than this super optimized, super fast performance. So hopefully this has, been, this has given you a few ideas to sort of go out there and try for yourself. And to go back to the original question, question I don't know if I've completely an answered it. You know, what makes a website fast? But I do have an answer, and the answer is super cheesy, because what makes a website fast is you. You do. Web experiences aren't fast because of magic. They're fast because developers care about performance and work hard to make it better. So we can provide you some of the tools and some of the technology that help you do this. But at the end of the day, it's your elbow grease and you digging in and caring about performance and making it work that is going to give your users the experience that they deserve. That's all I've got today. Uh, I hope to get your feedback on this session at google.com slash io slash schedule. I also want to call out before I go uh, that Jeff Posnick is giving a talk in an hour called Beyond Single Page Apps, Alternative Architectures for Your PWA, which also has tons of interesting things about building performant PWAs on Firebase hosting with cloud functions. And it's a totally different approach than I took here. So if you want to sort of get even more ideas to help you get started, I'd recommend that highly. Um, that's all I've got for today. I will be heading over to the Firebase Sandbox directly after this. And thanks for taking the time.